<laughs> as you move so powerfully among us in the worship. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you would anoint every heart that's in this room to hear what the wonderful things are about the Holy Spirit that they may or may not know, that they may already be walking in or that they have never even known. And Father, I just pray that you would give ears to hear and the words, Lord, would be breathed on by the life of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit's ministry is something that the church has so often overlooked. I mean, for me, I mean, I, my journey in the Lord started, and, and Bev's going to be coming back up in a minute to kind of share her experience, because what we want to do is we don't want this just to be teaching, because I can teach you. <laughs> That's my gifting. But I want to make sure that it's not just words, but you, we marry that, or marry that, intertwine that with experience. So you can see this really is real to us. It's just not words on a page. We're, we're literally talking about something we're living. And so I started as a Christian. My dad and mom were in the ministry. He was pastoring a Methodist church, and we lived in Huntington, West Virginia. I got saved at a Billy Graham crusade. Yeah, uh, I'm eight years old. My parents are singing in the choir and uh, in a different pl part of the stadium. And I'm sitting there with my sister and my, and my three uh, and my two brothers. And the invitation came and I got up and I walked down in a sea of people and gave my heart to the Lord at eight years of age. And I remember on one of the cards they have you sign when you go into the room with, where they talk to you about it. One of my friends was, had cancer, and I just, as a child, just put on there, God heal him of cancer, and never thought anything about it. Years later, I, through someone that came back into our life, realized he had actually been healed. D didn't know, um, but my life has always been interested in the supernatural. Uh, it's always been interested in being a part of a church where there were signs, wonders, and miracles. I was always, I always gravitated to the prophetic because it seemed like it pulled on my, the calling in my heart. So I, I always, there, I mean, I, there, was, there was times I really didn't understand why I felt a certain way, why I felt pulled to certain churches or certain leaders in my life. But it was part of my journey. And, you know, I'm, I really met the Holy Spirit I met, I met Jesus as my Savior and Lord when I was eight, but I met the Holy Spirit as my baptizer, which is what we're going to be talking about today when I was in eighth grade. My dad, who was a Methodist minister, got filled with the Holy Spirit at a full gospel businessmen's meeting, which was in the day pretty, pretty big for those of you that have been around for a while. And uh, he came home, prayed in tongues in our bathroom, which is right outside my bedroom. I thought he lost his mind. But I saw a change in his life. And so one evening when he came home from a meeting, he lined all the kids up. He laid hands on us, and we spoke in tongues and were baptized in the Holy Spirit. That began my journey in eighth grade. I was like a C student. But then when I went into ninth grade through high school, I was straight A's. It's, I mean, it totally changed my life. I graduated salutatorium, my class. Um, and... And therefore, you know, it just, it started my journey. I mean, I heard about speaking in tongues. I didn't realize what it did or how important it was. But I would speak in, time, in tongues from time to time. And then, you know, the journey began. And, you know, when later I met my wife uh, to be. And in 1981, we got married. And we started a family. And some of them are here today. Yeah. My son Isaac is here. David. You guys raise your hands. Nathan. And two of my granddaughters, Chloe and Gracie. And Jordan, Hannah. 
our friends of the family are here. Uh, David, David's wife's not here today. Uh, my other granddaughter is, is, has a cold, so play, pray for healing for that. But started, started family and trying to navigate through all that, seeing a lot along the way, um, and truly understand what it means by those that endure to the end shall be saved. There is, there is an endurance. Saw both fathers. Uh, Bev's father is the pastor of a church here in Raleigh. When we moved, we moved, we got married, moved up to West Virginia, moved back here. We're in, in a church called Rejoicing Life for many years. And, we, you know, we saw both of our fathers fall in ministry. We saw them, their faith shipwrecked. And so part of the message today that I really want to emphasize and Bev's going to, sh you know, share some of her experience of what God's been doing in her heart, is that the Holy Spirit is the one that has been given to us to help us fulfill the plan and purpose for our life. And a big part of that that's really undervalued is He helps us with the very things in our heart that are keeping us from fulfilling our faith so that our faith is not shipwrecked, so that we don't build something so high and then it collapses because of things in our heart that we never deal with. The Holy Spirit, He's here to help us. And so, um, there's, there's, many, there's many things that have happened that I've experienced uh, in my walk with the Lord uh, the worship movement, the worship symposiums where this Tabernacle of David revelation was given and we learned how to worship the Lord and, pray, and you know, and then the prophetic ministry where the prophets became more prominent and you were getting words of the Lord and, you know, people would come up and they would just read your mail and tell you everything about your life and, and uh, you know, we... We were part of all of that with healing where, you know, lay hands on the sick and they'll, they'll be recovered. And just was just eating it all up because I really, I, I knew that God wanted us to move in signs and wonders and miracles. But I didn't realize that the primary means of my edification and building me up was to be consistent and intentional every day in reading the scriptures, in praying in tongues, and fasting. And so, uh, just recently, uh, Marcus had indicated, I think it's two or three, or three or four months ago, had indicated uh, to Bev and myself, to kind of a challenge us to read this book. Walking, the walk of the spirit, the power, the the walk of power, by Dave Roberson, and so we thought, okay, and so we started reading it, and that's when it just kind of, it's like the Holy Spirit really highlighted this whole thing about purpose and destiny, and the Holy Spirit has been given responsibility to oversee the plan of my life. Wow. I, I never knew that. I mean. I've had lots of experiences throughout my life which have shaped me, which have marked me, which has caused me to want to raise my kids so that generationally there would be a legacy of kids, family that would serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That's always been on my heart, but a lot of my walk seems so hard. It, it just seemed like just, you know, struggling just to, you know, I, I pray a lot. There's lots of situations in our family. I want to see things change. But when I read this book and combined that with, okay, taking the challenge, Bev and I are going to pray an hour a day. Wow. In tongues. On purpose. <laughs> Intentionally. And combine that with reading the word intentionally a lot during the day, I started to see my life change. I started to see 
uh, areas where I've been praying and praying and praying with little, if any, results. Maybe little results, but not like I really wanted to see. Things in my family start to change. Answers to prayer start to happen very quickly. And so that's, that's, part of the, that's part of the process that we have learned to step into. And so, so I made the statement that the Holy Spirit is responsible for overseeing the plan of God for my life. So what does that look like? So some, there's some scriptures. Uh, Psalm 139, 16 to 18 says, Your eyes, God, saw me unformed. Yet in your book, all my days were written before any of them came into being. God has a book. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them. Notice that. If I could count them. They would be more in number than the, than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. If I could count them. You know, we just went on a vacation to, to a Carolina Beach. And, and I'm just sitting there. And I'm looking at the sand. If I could count them. How, what God thinks of me, if I could count it, it would be like the sand that I'm looking at. How many thoughts does God have toward me? Just think, if you think about that, that will blow your mind. And then I look out over the ocean, and I said, you know, the Scripture says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us rejoice in our hearts together. I look out all over the ocean, Wow, God, you're really big. Just this. You've created this. This is crazy. This is amazing. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12, it says, For who among people know the thoughts of a person except the spirit of the person that is in him? So also the thoughts of God. Remember we talked about his thoughts? The thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know, so that we may know. The Lord doesn't want us to be ignorant. That we may know the things freely given to us by God. As are all his thoughts that he's freely given to us. So Jesus said he would not leave us as orphans, but he would come to us. The original intent, if you the original intent of man, we just go back to the book of Genesis, chapter one, verse twenty six to twenty eight, it talks about having dominion. Talks about being fruitful, talks about multiplying, replenishing, subduing, and ruling. That's God's original intent for us in every area of our life. So, God calls us to an impossible life. It's impossible without a Savior. Before the earth was created, Jesus was slain before the foundations of the earth. He said yes to come because God knew that we couldn't accomplish his thoughts toward us unless he provided a savior. And when we, it says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. The Holy Spirit at that point of your speaking, confession, literally comes inside, takes your spirit that's dead and cannot connect with God, and explodes something brand new 
that has never existed before. You have a new communication channel inside of you that can communicate with God. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, and then He gives what's called the baptism in the Holy Spirit to totally transform us and make us into the image of Jesus. Holy Spirit, and we're here to honor the Holy Spirit's ministry, but His ministry is to conform us to Jesus, that we would look like Jesus, we would talk like Jesus, we would walk like Jesus in every area that, the, that we would see supernatural miracles and signs and wonders follow us where we're called to. Not everybody's called to the church. There's government, and everybody probably knows, maybe knows the seven mountains. There's government, there's education, there's media, there's uh, business. Any others? Families, the arts, the entertainment, and the church. And so wherever God has designed in his book for us to fulfill our calling, we need Jesus to be able to start that process by the rebirth of our spirit and then to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Uh, it was so important that when, when Jesus, in, it says in John 20, 22, it says that he breathed on his disciples. This is after his resurrection. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whew. You know, and they were born again. But then they had to wait. They had to wait to be filled with power. And so many times people just get saved, but we don't go that next step and ask. Because the, the scripture says that if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your kids, how much more will your father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? To have the power to live this impossible life. To give us the power to live this impossible life. The, the, they couldn't even fulfill the great commission that's recorded in, Acts, in Matthew 28, 19. Until... Jesus says in Acts 1, he, te he tells them, he commands them to wait in Jerusalem to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which he said is the promise of the Father. And, you know, along with that promise, he gives us this secret weapon. It's so underutilized so mis, mis, uh, mis, uh, misunderstood. Um, our mouth, it says in the scriptures, death and life is in the power of the tongue. James says that it's such an unruly member. Man, and he gives tongues so that the Holy Spirit can pray through us. Holy Spirit praying through us the perfect will of God. And so you might say, why tongues? Why would he give us something that would totally mess with our mind? He says he chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. There is no language on earth to be able to express the full extent of what God wants us to pray. The Bible says we do not know how to pray as we should. But the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groanings. And prays the perfect will of the Father. And so think about it. We have such a weapon that... If, if you literally think about in our spirit, the Holy Spirit, once, that, once we receive power in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's something that 
is in us with the Holy Spirit. It, he, he's creating this, this internal language in our spirit. And it says they spoke. They spoke as in Acts as the Spirit gave them utterance. We, had, we have to do the speaking. And so many times the stumbling block to speaking in tongues is we think we have to kind of conjure up the words in our head. But it really comes from here. And it's, the, it's one of the best ways to exercise our faith. is to step out and release the language that's inside of us. John 16, 13 to 15 says, When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own authority, but He will speak whatever He hears. He will tell you things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will receive from me and will declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I say he will take what is mine and will declare it to you. He, wants, he doesn't want us to be ignorant. He really doesn't. So every time we're speaking in tongues, the Holy Spirit is searching our heart with the intent to pray the perfect will of God. The scripture says we have the mind of Christ. Holy Spirit knows what the mind of Christ is for us. And so his purpose is to pray that through us. And you might say, well, why do I have to pray it? Why do I have to be involved He's our partner. Why doesn't God just heal someone? He says, lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. He wants us to do a physical act which represents faith. Every time I lay my hands on someone to pray for them, I'm exercising faith. I'm not healing them. The Spirit of God in me is being released with healing. When I prophesy the thoughts that God starts to speak through me, I, I have to open my mouth and say something, just like praying in tongues. I have to open my mouth and cooperate with what the Holy Spirit wants to do. Um, I've seen such a big difference in my life. It's hard, to, it's hard to explain. I never realized what the edification process was all about. Um, it's, you know, it's incredible the fact that we can try and try and try and try and pray and pray and pray and want to try to understand why am I here? What does God call me to do? Uh, why don't these habits in my life ever fall off? Um, I keep trying, I keep trying. And, and, and I'm able to quit things for a while, but they keep coming back. What in the world is wrong with my life? And, you know, God has given us a will. And wisdom is to know how to use our will appropriately. And so I exercise my will to read the word. I exercise my will to speak in tongues. I exercise my will to, when the Holy Spirit begins to reveal something in me that is really hurting my life, I have to choose to, to let it fall off. He comes with the power to destroy the things in my life that are hurting me. But I have to like Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. I have to choose. I still have to choose. My will still has an active part, but the Holy Spirit comes with the power to change me. Um, we talked, Pastor uh, talked last week, uh, and it was, it was an amazing understanding of uh, the book of Jude uh, concerning the edification process. And in Jude 17 through 20, it says, But, beloved, remember the words that were previously spoken, previously spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that 
said to you, in the last days there will be scoffers who will walk after their own ungodly desires. These are men who cause divisions, sensual, devoid of the spirit. Notice that devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Ghost. And so edification is building up our faith. There's a building up of, and Marcus last week talked about this, this structure, this superstructure that the Holy Spirit builds on the inside of us as we pray in tongues. It is built to be able to house the anointing of God and to qualify us for our divine calling. The, the Holy Spirit is, is really good about the fact that if we'll continue to submit to what He's doing in our, in our life, He will help prune the areas of our life that are going to eventually down the road shipwreck our faith if we don't do anything about it. But He builds us up to a certain point of strength to where we can let things go. And so I just want to call Bev up right now and Uh, there's a scripture in 1 John 2, 27 that says, But the anointing which you have received from him remains in you, and you do not need anyone to teach you, for the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is truth and is no lie, just as he has taught you. Remain in him, 1 John 2, 27. And so as we intentionally invest in spending time in the word and meditation, as we're praying in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit teaches us. I, when I'm re reading the Word and praying in tongues, it's amazing thoughts that the thoughts that go through your mind. I've never seen this before. I mean, the Lord begins to reveal things to you, and He begins to show you attitudes of selfishness. You know, lust. He starts, he starts to show you where, you know, anger. You know. Uh, I'm a little passive here. You're better than that. The Holy Spirit reminds us, you're better than that. You know, and He helps us. He tries, He helps us, to, He helps bring us to a point of change. And at that point, we have to choose. So I'm going to let Bev, she has some experiences with the edification process. And especially as that um, involves purging and what God has been doing in her. Uh, we're both seeing a change it's amazing. We have family meetings. I don't know if anybody has family meetings. We have, we have adult children, and we do have family meetings still uh, because we are concerned for their souls, and we come to, along to encourage them as they're going through things. As we're going through things, they encourage us. But they told us the other day, it's been a week ago, that they have seen us, like, transform within the last year from, like, night and day. And there's, there's authority in what we say, there's authority in how we pray. There's authority in how we walk. And things just are getting better and better because we're allowing the Holy Spirit. We're not perfect, but we're on the journey. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story because I feel like then when I give you the examples of what the Holy Spirit's been doing in me, you can see the contrast. So I came to the Lord when I was 12 years old. Um, my mom had divorced and remarried a backslidden preacher. And he was not preaching at the time. He was playing in the nightclubs. That's what we called him back then. He was a musician, and he had come from a family that was very broken. A um, circuit writer preacher was his father. And so all he knew of religion was hard, difficult times, trying to get enough food on the table trying to understand why there were so many children. He was the oldest of 14. So that was his background. He had been homeless at times, you know, and then he had been very successful at times. And so he brought into our life, because I, I did not know the Lord at this time, he brought into our lives something that we had never, ever experienced. I mean, the Methodist church was totally different than what he had experienced as a Pentecostal preacher's son. 
So he brought, he brought us to an assembly of God where they were really dynamic and the power of the Spirit was moving and they were all, he would jump up, the pastor would jump up on the, on the platform and be spitting and kind of like, um, it's just sort of like a, um, a maniac. <laughs> That's what it appeared to me. I mean, I just felt like, wow. And so we, but when I went the first time, and I remember my siblings were very quiet, but when I went the first time, I, I felt the presence of God. And I knew that something was very different about this, this way of life. As a child, I remember looking out the window when my dog would run away, and I would say, God, please bring my dog back. You know, I just always turned to God when I had a need, when I was really sad, and I didn't know the Lord at all at this time. So that shows you how he knows all your days. I mean, he was setting me up to, to receive Jesus. So as my... Um, my father came back to the Lord and stopped playing the nightclubs, and he decided he was going to drive potato trucks in Idaho. And so that, just to make ends meet, and we were living out in a little farmhouse out in Idaho, and every day I would say, God, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What had been presented to me was the power that happens in your life, and you will change on the inside. That's all I knew. I mean, I knew very little else. I knew there was such a thing as tongues because the church taught that and so forth. And so I remember for a year and a half asking God for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I expected him to descend on me, charge me with power. There would be lightning. I mean, I really did. At 13 and a half, I just expected this amazing, crazy thing to happen. And of course, when I finally did get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I realized it was available all along. I had just let my head get in the way, kind of like Pastor says, it took him five times, you know. I don't know what, where all that came from, but we began to travel because my father was an inventor. He's a very interesting person, my stepfather, and he invented a hang glider, and in that day, hang gliders were not common at all. In fact, I don't even know if he knew of any, but he liked to fly, so he invented a hang glider and built it at home. And they went out on the rim rocks, they called it, in, in Montana, where we lived. And they, he just had somebody pull him off the cliff. Well, <laughs> now he had come back to the Lord, but I, I don't know exactly where he was at. And we heard about it because we were in school. He went crashing down. We had what we call little dust devils in, in Montana in that area. They were like small little tornadoes that would grab things and just throw them. And he hit, and one of those hit him when he was about 150 feet in the air. And he came diving down and hit the ground, just barely clearing it, but his body did not clear it. Because you hang a hang glider, you hang on and you hold on. Well, the reason that is so significant is because he was healed miraculously from a broken femur bone that had plowed in the dirt. He had gangrene in his leg. They were telling me he was, they, that he were going to actually, you know, cut his leg off. And I remember the night before he was supposed to have his leg amputated, the pastor of another church, I mean, this man was powerful in the spirit, came walking into his hospital room. He said, you are Lenny Anderson. He said, yes. And he, and he walked around and he said, God spoke to me about you. He said, He's not only going to heal you completely right now, but you are going to be, you're called into the ministry and have been running from it all your life. Well, that was, that was amazing to us, you know. And sure enough, God did it. He actually had to sneak out of the hospital because they would have arrested him if he had left and he was, you know, he, it was full of gangrene. The gangrene left and his brothers helped him to cut off the body cast, because they had a big body cast that they had put him in, helped him to cut it off. It took about three hours. <laughs> and all of us kids are just watching this happen, you know? It's like, I, I was honestly like, when he stands up on that leg, what's going to happen? It held. He went back to the hospital. They took an x-ray, and they just had no explanation for it. They said two weeks have gone by. A femur bone does not heal in two weeks. It takes a long time. That launched us into what my father believed what the pastor said, and he knew that there was always something he was supposed to do with his life. And that launched us into selling our, our or really moving out, it was rented, and traveling in a bus for six and a half years, 
ministering the gospel, signs, wonders, miracles, all over the nation. I mean, it was a really an amazing experience, you know? So my vision or how I saw the Holy Spirit at that time and throughout many decades since is that you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you get the jolt of power, and then you can minister to others. So when you use the tongues, it's when you're ministering to others. Or you can pray in tongues if you want to, but why would you want to? I mean, it's just babble, you know. And that's the way I saw the Holy Spirit in the midst of the charismatic movement. Those of you that remember the charismatic movement, you know that some people saw it that way. So I loved God. I loved the Holy Spirit. I would talk to him at times and so forth, and the Father and Jesus. And and I always had a, a very tender heart towards the Lord from the time I became a Christian. But when it got to the Holy Spirit, it was just to get the power. It's kind of like if you received a merit badge, if you could say, I'm spirit-filled. You know, I'm not in a dead church. I'm, I'm, you know. Well, for years and years went by, and I remember seeing a lot of people healed, delivered, set free. Um, it wasn't every meeting that we went to, but some were, it was in mass. I saw God move, and I had a whole new appreciation for it. But I still didn't have any idea what the Holy Spirit could do in my personal life. I just thought, well, you know, I had to pray for people a lot. Dad would call us up, kids, come out and pray, you know, and we would come up and we would pray for people, and sometimes we'd see, you know, amazing things, and sometimes we wouldn't. You know, it was just, it was dependent on the person's faith and a lot of things. So when we came to this church, I remember walking in the door, and we've always been in spirit-filled churches ever since we got married. Um, so we've always looked for those that had the, the signs and the wonders and the miracles, or that at least they believed it. They were open to it. You know, God is a God that wants to be, he's a heart God that wants to know us well, because he does, but we didn't, if we don't know it, how can we participate in that relationship, you know? So when we walked into this church, I remember instantly it hit me, this is a place of authority and I remember knowing that there is something here that I hadn't seen for a really long time since the charismatic movement. I wasn't sure what it was, you know. Um, so we started taking the classes, and, and I remember thinking, because I was a student of um, the Word of Faith movement back when, before I got married to, to Darwin, I remember thinking, oh, yeah, I remember a lot of these things. But then as... As we learned more and more through these classes, I felt this, this foundation being built in my heart stronger than I had ever had. We went through it twice, you know, and once helping a little bit, and then the other time just to receive and do the work. I'm telling you, if you haven't taken new man, it will change your life. All you have to do is be intentional about listening to it every week and just write down notes of what you're getting from it and come to class. It is life changing. I felt a lot of things happen in my heart and in my mind and in my spirit by taking new man. So that's a little plug for that class. But I will tell you this, since Marcus spoke to us and challenged us to begin to really pray in the Holy Spirit, in tongues, and reading that book really equipped me. Um, and I, I mean, you can read it over and over and over and still get more out of it equipped me to begin to look up a lot of these scriptures that I had not paid attention to when I was a young person and I was just, you know, um, wanting that jolt, you know. As I started to pray in the Holy Spirit, I remember the very first time I made my decision, I'm going to go into my closet because that's the most quiet, and I'm going to get down on my knees. I'm just going to pray in spirit for an hour, and I'm going to keep my phone here so I know how long it's been. I don't want to go over that. <laughs> I started to pray, and, and it was within... I think 15 minutes that the presence of God grabbed my heart. And I'm not talking about a nice little feel. It's like he showed me how he had grieved and missed me. I felt the Holy Spirit saying, I have missed you, and I want to meet with you. And a spirit of repentance came on me, and I just, for the first probably 30 minutes, I just cried. And I just said, God, I'm sorry. You know, I'm so ready to have more of you. 
I've done the, the worship route, and I've, we've done all these routes to, to find you, to find you, and to live with your, and the people would say, oh, I had the fire in my heart, and I would say, I don't feel fire. I just, maybe a little passion, but I don't feel fire. The last pastor we had, he said, don't you ever feel fire? And I said, no, I don't, you know, and I'm, I'm a, I feel deeply when God moves on me, but I've never felt fire. After two weeks, I started feeling the fire. And I didn't know exactly what was happening, but it started to be more apparent when he started my, taking my mind to the things that needed to be let go, that needed to be repented from. And he helped me to do it. That's the difference. I remember for years trying to change certain attitudes, like a critical attitude or a negative attitude or judging or selfishness at times. Those things that would come up and I would just say, God, help me to not be that way. Lord, please, you know. But I never thought about speaking in tongues about it. I never thought about engaging the power of the Holy Spirit to help me do that. Now that's the way I live. And to give you an example of some of the things, I just jotted down a couple things. Negativity. I felt like my mind had become so negative because of things we had gone through, tough things in our life, that I was everything was negative. And I remember at times just thinking, I don't even want to spend time with Darren right now because I know all I'm going to want to do is talk about negative things, you know? And God changed that really fast. I mean, a day or two. And it's like all of a sudden, I just kept speaking in tongues. I just kept spending time with him, not even knowing really what he was doing until he would show me. And so I just did it in faith, you know, to believe. I, well, I've tried changing myself. I'm really good at pretending I'm this and that in church and around people. But in my heart, these things need, needed to change. I thank God for the Holy Spirit. I tell you, he can do what we can never imagine doing in our own strength. It may take a month. It may take a day. It may take a year. But it happens. So some of the things was a negativity. Um, my conscience was literally awakened to as the minute that something would come to me and I could just refuse it. And he gave me the power to do that. I could feel his strength helping me to do that. So another thing was to not judge other people, especially their motives. You know, it's really easy when you see someone that's struggling with something. You don't know their life. You don't know their story. You don't know what all they've been through. But he does. He's the only one that really does. So I stopped. I, I, at first, I had to make myself say, well, they haven't been through as much as we have, or, or they can't be that hard. Look, they have a lot more money than we do, and do, do, do. And all of a sudden, it, it's like I had to make that decision to be that way rather than at a default. And so I chose. I wasn't perfect at first. It took me probably about a month and a half to two months, I mean, I'm estimating, to really release that and let that go. And Darwin's going to explain... Um, are you going to explain some of what happens? Okay. Just a couple other things quickly. I learned how to not embellish the truth. And that's one thing that David Roberson talks about in his book. When you're an evangelist's daughter, and they love to make things sound even bigger than they are, I just kind of adopted that. That, that way of mm. looking at things and say, well, you know, I had 10 people I prayed for and they all got saved when really it was like maybe three and two of them got saved. You know, I would just embellish things and make things sound better just so that I could feel better about myself. And so that's speaking Lord, evangelistically. Yeah, evangelistically. That's what my dad used to call it. <laughs> but that was a big deal. I mean, it, it really was. And that was one of the easiest things that came off. You can feel it leaving, not physically, but you can see it leaving in your life when it just doesn't affect you anymore. Now, this is over four months, so, you know, um, it didn't happen instantly. But um, and a couple other things, my internal conversation, my thoughts, and what I'm saying to myself. If you're self-aware enough, you'll know that that goes on all the time. Sometimes my thoughts would just be sad or depressed or wanting to go back to the past. Now my internal thoughts, I would say 95% of the time are positive. They're like full of joy, 
you know, no more feeling sorry for myself, you know, knowing that God is with me, and, and they may not even know why they're not negative, but they are, they're there. It's like the Holy Spirit is just filling, filling those areas Amen. that used to be just, you know, full of thorns and difficult things. And then I'll just say this as a last thing. God's giving me a courage to do new things. Amen. I mean, I had a lot of fears just kind of pushed down, didn't know they were there. Remember, the Holy Spirit searches your heart. He, every time I pray, there's something that he brings up. And it may just be how great I'm doing at it, you know. And it's not in a negative context as far as, like, if someone had said it to you, like Darwin had said to me, you need to stop doing this because this is how it looks. If he said that, and he very seldom does, but if he did, you know how that makes you feel. You feel kind of shamed and like, why can't I do this? And da, da, da. It's not like that when the Holy Spirit shows you. And that's one way you can know if it's the accuser or the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit shows me something, I feel so loved in all of it. It's like he loves us. He knows every thought. Even he knows the things that we think even before we say them. He knows how to search out our heart, and he knows how to change us. And it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it is just a wonderful walk. So those are the, the highlighted things that I can think of okay. that God hey. has done in my life. There's a lot more, but they're Go ahead. impressive. Go ahead and step here. Go ahead and step here. Uh, Roman, Romans 8, 26 to 28 says that likewise the Spirit helps our weakness. You know, in, isn't God good that he, that he knows left to ourselves we'll self-destruct? But He gives us help because He knows that we are unable, there's an inability to, in our own strength, Fulfill that which we, the reason that we were placed here. And you know, we try. Men, we, re, we really try that. That old pride that gets in the way. But I, want, I just want to submit something to you that was a revelation to me. I had never seen this before. I'll submit this to you for you to chew on. But in that same scripture, where it talks about how the Holy Spirit helps our weakness, we do not know how to pray for as we ought, he intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And it talks about how he searches our heart because he wants to intercede for us according to the will of God. It then, And I've never seen this next sentence within that context before. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And so, what I saw is that praying in the Spirit is what arranges everything in our life to work together for good. That's how important it is. And we neglect it, and it's to our own demise, because God has given us something that is powerful. And Bev talked about, and I won't go into this, because she, she taught this through her experience about how it wakes up our conscience. The more we pray in the Spirit consistently, daily, for longer periods of time, our conscience wakes up. The things that we used to do, we can't do anymore. You combine that with the Word. This is another scripture I had never seen before. It talks that, it says, The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing between soul and spirit, between joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In Ephesians, it says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. So, if the Holy Spirit's responsibility is to grow us up in becoming more like Jesus and to help eliminate things from our life that are detrimental, what does He use? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Marrying these two principles together is what puts our life on, so to speak, crude example, steroids. When it comes to launching us into a future where nothing is impossible because he helps us deal with the root of the fleshly works in our life that are 
uh, limiting and causing um, stunting. That's the word I'm looking for. Stunting our growth. Stunting our potential. Stunting us becoming and fulfilling the purpose's intent. And just to, and just to say, I kind of get ready to wrap this up, just to say that there's seasons of our lives. We've been through a lot of seasons where we didn't know certain things, so we didn't walk in it. But you know what? We're in a season where we're learning new things through the DHT, through the uh, new man class, through learning about how important praying in the Spirit is and reading the Word of God and fasting. These principles have awakened in us an understanding that God is holding us accountable to walk in. There's a new freedom that is a result of it. In this season, we've walked with the Lord for years. And I look at it, I think, Lord, it could have been a lot easier if I'd have known those things Much back there. Much easier, yes. <laughs> Would have been a lot easier. Got, got, Would have got there a lot faster. But then I realized that God is more interested in the process than the destination. He's building something in us that, and it's always been our desire, would last for generations. But through our kids and through their kids. See, if, God, if God's thoughts, I go back to that, if God's thoughts are like the sand toward us, that's generational. I mean, how can you exhaust that? You, you need to live your life and your kids live their life and their kids and their kids and then see it go on and on and on to exhaust the thoughts that God has toward us. They give us a future and a hope. And, and it says that we're born into a living hope. A living, and the Word of God is active and alive. And so we're given, that gives the Holy Spirit something to work with, by the way, just as a side note, for, uh, that when we pray in tongues, he, he, that's how we get revelation. That he's, you know, that things that we're praying come back to us in insight and wisdom. And so, say in a business world, you have a, a business situation that you can't see a breakthrough, pray in tongues. Holy Spirit knows and prays for all that's concerning you, and just listen to the wisdom that comes back. It's a process. We grow into that. And so, what we have talked about today, if you will embrace it by faith, it will open the door to another world. It will open the door to another world. You'll see things. You'll have courage. All the things that Bev talked about the working he does in our heart, everything. We were called to live in a place where every day we face the impossible, but we have the courage to face it and walk through it. Amen. And so Bev has a prayer. I'm going to have her pray uh, that really kind of encap cap encapsulates a lot of what we've talked about. Um, but, I, you know, if you're like me, I need to be intentional or it doesn't get done. So I set aside time in the morning just to pray in tongues for an hour. And, it's not, and sometimes less or sometimes more. It's, it's not a perfect model, but it's, I do it consistently. It's like another example, going to the gym, which I like to work out, uh, trying to stay healthy as I, I get older. Uh, if I'm not intentional about that and set aside time, there's a lot of times I don't want to go. But I do it because I've committed myself to it. And it's the same thing about reading the Word and praying in tongues. Set aside time just to be intentional about it and, and just watch to see what happens. Uh, Mar as I said in the beginning, Marcus challenged us to pray in tongues an hour a day for a year. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't recognize ourselves at the end of that well, we're, we are obviously starting to see the change, and we're just in the beginnings of that. We're in a journey, you know, and so I invite you to join that journey and see if in a year, if you'll not recognize yourself. So, 
the Lord woke me up the other night, and I know it's him when I'm in a sound sleep, and then all of a sudden I wake up, and I, this thought goes whoo, right in my face. And he said, just craft a prayer of thanksgiving, because I am so thankful. So thankful to you, Marcus, so thankful to everyone who's been part of the process that we are going through, and thankful, thankful to this church for being so faithful to the scriptures, so faithful to the real gospel, so faithful to teach fasting and, and prayer and all the things that we do. Because it's, it's not the common thing in a lot of churches today. That's changing. We're believing God for that. But So anyway, I woke up and the Lord said, craft a prayer of thanksgiving for what you're teaching to, for the end of the message. And I went, okay, I got to get up. And I did, and I got up, and I just started typing it out. So this is not a deliverance prayer. This is not a mighty, powerful prayer. This is a prayer, if you all want to engage, you can close your eyes as I read it. What it's doing is in thanksgiving to God for this process that he's offered us. And it'll be kind of a summary of what we've talked about today and what Pastor has talked about the last couple weeks a little bit, too. So um, just... If you want, you can close your eyes and listen to it. And then after we're done with that, if Pastor, if you want to come up and, and or you want Darren to do it? Okay. All right. Heavenly Father, you have always had us in your heart. You began it all in a garden filled with your creation and presence. Everything was beautiful and full of peace and order. From the garden you created to our fall from grace, and all the centuries of your faithfulness and revealing of who you are, we needed a Savior. And we knew that through disobedience and rebellion, and you knew as well, mankind caused a separation from you. But you, in your great mercy and goodness, unfolded a way of redemption. You knew we needed to be saved from ourselves and our self-imposed death. Thank you for sending Jesus, your Son, the Logos of the Trinity. He perfectly paid that, all that our guilt required through his sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection from the dead. And he is now and forever our king. We are restored, adopted as sons and daughters, and have been given incredible authority to rule and reign with King Jesus. Your love towards us has truly been revealed to us. So thank you, Jesus. When you left this earth, you said you would not leave us as orphans, that you would send the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to be our helper, literally another Savior. You said he would be our teacher, intercessor, and comforter to lead us into all truth. We know on that per powerful day of Pentecost over 2,000 years ago, you sent the Holy Spirit to a group of followers waiting in Jerusalem. The Bible tells us the roar of the wind of the Holy Spirit was so overcoming and so powerful, it was all the crowd could bear, and he filled the house where they were sitting. Divided tongues of fire came upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as he gave them that ability. Jesus, you once again fulfilled your promise. So today, we truly are grateful. We're thankful for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We are thankful for the third being of the Godhead living in us. Wow. We are thankful that as we join with him, speaking in tongues, he is interceding with Jesus for and through us to build an edifice, that superstructure on the inside of us, so we will be able to house your presence and power without faltering or becoming prideful. We will be able to bring your kingdom to earth. We are thankful that as we continue to pray in tongues, the Holy Spirit is enabling us to change, literally to see our weaknesses be transformed by his power into strength, that he will show us our old works of the flesh, such as selfish ambition, unforgiveness, hatred, stubbornness, jealousies, and so forth, and will with our agreement, put them to death. We are thankful we can see the power of sin crumble as the purging of sinful thoughts and fruitless beliefs are removed from our heart, and that he, through the word and our cooperation, transforms our mind into the mind of Christ. 
We can see life through your lens and be able to fulfill our individual destiny. Help us to never take the Holy Spirit for granted, Lord. Help us to always honor and treasure him as he brings us closer to you and shows us all things that you want us to know. We thank you for your matchless wisdom and mercy for this gift. Amen. Wow, powerful. You know, the scripture also says that it's by the Spirit that you mortify the deeds of the flesh. It's not by willpower. Willpower is just choosing to cooperate with the Holy Spirit when he shows us things. But the Holy Spirit literally can put to death the deeds of the flesh. And some, and some that are mentioned in Galatians, uh, it says, Now the works of the flesh, this is Galatians 5, 19 and 20. Now the works of the flesh that are evident are sexual impurity, immorality, sexual and sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, uh, dissensions, divisions, envy, uh, drunkenness, orgies, etc. And the Holy Spirit can help us where those are weaknesses. And, and just to reiterate, Marcus talked last week about the there's diversity of tongues. What we're talking about today is the personal prayer language that God has given us. There's also the, the praying, praying in tongues, which is like a message given in a, in a congregation with an interpretation. There's also like the day of Pentecost where they spoke in tongues. And it was in the native language of the people they, that they spoke to. They didn't know what they were speaking, but they spoke in the language of the people. That was supernatural. We're not, we're not talking about those two cases. We're talking about the personal prayer language, our prayer partner, the Holy Spirit, and cooperating with him. So I just want to just throw it out there that if you fall into the category where you have never invited Jesus into your heart to be your Savior and Lord, that's where it starts, where you can experience a uh, a life-changing, altering, being born again to where all old things pass away, all things become new. Your spirit becomes alive where it was cut off from the life of God. Now the life of God is in you like a river. And, and then next step is the baptism of the Holy Spirit where you are endued with power to be able to live this life and be his witnesses in the earth. So I just want to encourage you, even... If you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but you're struggling in your prayer language, God can set you free to where you can start to freely begin to speak. It's under our control. You can start and stop at any time to pray in tongues. But it 